Hello, everyone, and welcome to National Sculpture Society's virtual series of studio tours, interviews, and conversations. Today, we are visiting Richard McDonald's studio in Monterey, California. This is a special opportunity to experience one of the great sculpture studios of the world and to visit with the sculptor himself. We will first go to Carmel, California, just south of Monterey on the Pacific coast to the Dawson Cole Fine Art Gallery, which represents Richard McDonald. Michelle Jason is the gallery principal and no one is better suited to introduce Mr. McDonald, as she is also his daughter. I am now going to just spotlight Michelle. And we have um, hundreds of guests in attendance. So I ask that you please remain muted through the program and ask questions in the chat room. Thanks so much. And please join me in welcoming Michelle McDonald Jason. Thank you, Gwen, and welcome to beautiful Carmel, California. I'm delighted to introduce you to the gallery and to my father, Richard McDonald. What most people don't realize is he's actually a classically trained painter and illustrator. And so he went to Art Center in Pasadena, and when my brother and I were growing up, this is what he was doing, painting and illustrating, doing works for the NBA, the NFL, other Fortune 500 companies, as well as uh, multiple times doing drawings for the Olympics. And it was actually in the, during the 1984 Olympics that he started dabbling in clay as a way to further study what he was drawing. And this, in essence, became the, was the birth of his sculpting career. And his original idea was that he would get a body of work together and then go out and get some gallery representation. And all went according to plan until a few months in, there was a devastating fire that destroyed everything in his studio, including our family dog. And so he was left with, what do I do now? Do I go back to what I know so I can put food on the table for my family? Or do I follow my heart? And obviously the rest is history. Over the next three and a half years, he was able to get representation in over 72 galleries and uh, then decided that it would also be good to open up our own family owned galleries. So in addition to Carmel, we have Laguna Beach, Las Vegas and Palm Desert. Over the next 33 years, he's created over 650 works of art and did a number of monuments. One of them being the 1996 uh, Olympic monument called Flair Across America, and here more locally, a monument for the Pebble Beach 2000 US Open Golf Tournament uh, called Momentum. And over the years, he's been in hundreds of exhibitions and won numerous awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, a honorary doctorate, and he's even been knighted. His absolute greatest passion is to create artwork that he loves. And he's also very much hopeful and uh, desirous of being able to extend into everybody's lives the significance of what figure of art can bring to us. And beyond that, he's a proponent of being able to foster and mentor other up and coming artists. And to this end, he's had a number of master work uh, workshops in his studio, as well as other colleges and universities around the country. And so without further ado, it is my greatest honor and pleasure to introduce my father and world-renowned artist, Richard McDonald from his Monterey, California studio.
Welcome to my studio. I'm Richard McDonald. I first want to thank Glenn and all the people from the National Sculpture Society, my daughter, and all the people that work here. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come visit. Uh, it's going to be pretty difficult to show this studio in the limited time we have. Uh, it's 25,000 square feet on three acres, and we do everything from top to bottom, including the state of the art foundry. In front of you is Butterfly. Uh, this is uh, a bronze. I, uh, my uncle once said, you're not very good, but you're slow. So this piece I worked on for 11 years before I finally cast it bronze. And uh, you can see here, you came in with the flare across America. And then these two uh, pieces are for the Royal Ballet, uh, about 13 feet. And uh, now we'll take a tour of that. Take a tour of the studio. Come on in. So in the first part of the studio, this uh, uh, we have a lot of guests that come in, both clients and dignitaries, et cetera. And then this studio was used for many years as a teaching facility. In fact, we used to advertise it in the National Social Society. Uh, and so we'd have people come in from all over the world. Only 20 were allowed by portfolio. And then we would, we would have these work, workshops uh, once or twice a year. In this gallery, you'll see uh, different pieces at different size. Uh, the one in the middle is called Spirit, uh, and it has a, a light, and, and it's quite, quite beautiful. It's a little dark in here today now at this time of day. This is a maquette for the Royal Ballet, a composition uh, called the Grand Coda. And uh, so this then went on to become 16 feet and 13 feet on both sides. Um, this <laughs> is when I was an illustrator. I had done this piece for the, I was commissioned by the Olympics to do paintings for the 78, 80, 84 Olympics. And so I did this piece and then the Olympics wanted to do this 50 feet tall, but they never made up their mind. So I finally did the big piece you saw at front and put it together and then donated it to the 1996 Olympics. Uh, each one of these pieces are the in-between sizes. I go through a whole process, so it takes years. This is a Nureyev. Uh, this is the half-life area. They're a little larger than half-life, but uh, this is um, uh, midnight, excuse me, nightfall. And there's concepts here of the crescent of the moon and hope of the future and release the past. Uh, this is called Guardian. And there's just a few of them. My daughter said 600, but my uh, operations officer said we actually have done 900. <laughs> Uh, plus uh, a couple thousand drawings and some games. I, I actually love to paint, but sculpture is completely taken over, so I don't really have a lot of time these days. This is called Diana and the Coursing Cheetahs. And the reason it's here is that this is my phoenix. I had a fire that burned my studio down, and I just heard George Lundin had a fire in the studio. I sent him a message. It's a difficult thing. Uh, wiped me out, destroyed everything I owned, killed my dog, and the state of Alaska sued me for specific performance because their monument was in the fire. So after that, I fought the fire and lost this piece that was in wax. So about three and a half, four years later, after the fire, I had developed over some uh, about 70 galleries worldwide and um, distribution. And so I decided to redo this piece. That's why I called it the Phoenix. So instead of drawing through the bars with the cheetah, I actually brought the cheetah in with a mountain lion and a black panther in a circle so I could really study uh, entirely. And so this cheetah is named Simburu. And uh, ran in, I took him out in the valley here and ran him at 60 miles an hour. It was really cool. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of different pieces. I won't stop at each piece, there's too many. Um, down the center core that we're gonna go through here, this is the office core. Uh, this is where uh, accounting and media inventory, um, the uh, vice president of operations, uh, Idris Rona, and my uh, assistant, uh, Mindy Hell, will introduce a little bit. And uh, so as we go through, you'll see original drawings. Uh, you'll see um, uh, sculpture that's done. This is Cinema Verde, uh, excuse me, this is uh, DiGiorni. These are all done in my London studio. I had two studios in London for a few years working on the Royal Ballet. And so these were very fast. 
I don't use any photography for any of the sculpture. Uh, and I just go live and from memory and my knowledge, et cetera. And uh, I don't do drawings necessarily before either. This is our studio uh, commitment. Bridge McDonald Studios is committed to making a difference to mankind by passionately creating art works of art of cultural and historical significance while dramatically enriching people's lives. That's what connects us. And by the way, we're still standing after the pandemic. I know all of you and all of us had a tremendous problem there. And it's just resilience. We have to have resilience and move forward. Now we're gonna go into another gallery. And in this gallery uh, along the wall are some of my very first pieces. I started with a silent medium within a silent medium. That's actually an original drawing uh, called White Face. And from that, I then developed this whole series of mimes. <clears throat> You'll see, um, you know, uh, all kinds of celebrities. And this is the Guinness Book of World Records here with, uh, I had 40 uh, people on Pommel Horse. The gymnast I took for a 10 city black tie tour through America, um, bringing to people the power and the exceptional connection of figure art. And so I thought that was one way to do that. Uh, so we have original drawings again. And uh, this is a heroic uh, rain. This is a very old piece. And uh, here it is in a park with this little boy. I love that shot. Um, and then you'll see different, when you see the half-life, that means I did one smaller and then this is the next size up. My hands are so big that doing the small works, these are very quick. These are a matter of hours. So this, this model, there's no photography. So this guy did three different poses and he'd move from one to the other. So he could still walk at the end of the day. And um, a quite exceptional performer. And that's one of the other great things that I have great gratitude for. I have met some of the greatest people on this planet and some of the most talented people on this planet. Uh, and uh, we work together. So in that creation, we, in that creativity, we, it sponsors and inspires really uh, new work. This is the famous Carlos Acosta, one of the most famous dancers in the world. And uh, this was done in my studio in um, London. And this study is about four hours. So you can see that thumb just moving through here as quickly as possible. Because I was on the plane back and forth from London and these guys were busy too. So we would get together and I did a whole series about 12 of them that are to join it where they all had to be under 12 hours. This is uh, students I was teaching. And now we'll move, uh, move through. This is another good journey of the same um, dancer, uh, Carlos Acosta. So now down through the hallway, as I said, we have our accounting. Uh, this is Charmaine. Charmaine is in our accounting office and handles all the numbers to make sure that we can cash our checks. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, down the hall, in the, this is our copy room, but that sculpture is for the, the Fernandez, of course, they had commissioned me to do a six foot oil painting. And when they came down to see the painting, I had done a clay study and they said, we love the painting, but what about a thousand of those? <laughs> so I said, let me do something special. And so I did this piece called Free Rain, which is obviously uh, pretty commercial and done with their two symbols, the Clydesdale stallion and then the eagle. And I was fortunate enough to have that eagle, uh, seven foot eagle in my studio in Atlanta. And I had another uh, bald eagle, full size, pretty amazing. So as we go, these are all just real quick studies. Uh, this is called Essence. All of the bronzes that you're seeing here are cast 100% here. So we, I create them here, we do the molds here, we do the hard copies, all copies and move right on through the foundry um, process, of which most all of you know <laughs> what that's about, so I don't need to explain it to you. This is another DiGiorni, so this is very quick study that you, is the, ma the maquette for the one outside this 13 feet. She was the young British dancer of the year. And here we have Angelina, she's in media uh, and um, marketing and imagery. Over here, we have a, a signing room and a library and marketing materials. And this is where I sign books and so forth. Another maquette for Diane Eric the Moon. 
And this piece is now about, uh, I guess, 12 feet tall. So we go along and this is the operations officer who's handling the camera, <laughs> Adris Rana. And here we have Mindy Held. She's the executive assistant. Fantastic. Uh, more offices, and you'll see here, let me sh uh, show you, and is your screen on? Mm -hmm. So each, each, because uh, I want to share with you. So in each office we have, it's all computer linked, uh, and this gives uh, a full schedule of what's going on, our priorities, ABC 4515s and so forth, that I developed uh, many, many years ago, and that's how we get things done, and I'm able to create. Um, uh, this is our, from, I don't know if you can see that. It's an illustration for American Express's annual report. And here, I love this. This is a, a cartoonist who was a famous guy. <laughs> so he did this cartoon and he's, this sculpture is the one he used that you see in the background there. And there she is doing the thing. Now, as we move forward, um, yeah, there's the other television screen. Uh, I do a lot of uh, graphics, drawings, uh, bas reliefs, uh, a carved marble, a carved plaster, and, um, and clay I like because it has a, a facility to it. Uh, and here's another graphic. Uh, this is a, this one, there's an original, of course, but this is the serigraph that I made uh, by hand. And um, we have another statement here. I believe that beauty connects people and lifts their spirits to a higher level. I have dedicated my career to making a difference by creating passionate and emotive works of art that enrich other people's lives. Now we're gonna move into our, our conference room. Uh, this is where we have a lot of meetings. Uh, we have a lot of uh, companies and people that come in and, and uh, we entertain or talk about projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, in here, you'll also see, uh, I, I do, I love plein air painting. So this is a plein air painting that's from my deck in my house in Carmel. And here's another De Germany. So this is a very famous dancer, Stephen McCray. And this is called Chroma. And so again, there's no photography, but this guy is moving like crazy. And the way I like to work is I, I don't take a one particular uh, view. I study it from start to finish. I learned that from Rodin. And so then I put these pieces together so they look like they're in motion and movement because I really love the motion and movement. I don't do these anymore, but that's a lucite. This is a piece called Carnival. Uh, very, just a, a moving dancer. I like to do her a little larger. So um, uh, another, this is one of my last illustrations. This is for Newsweek and Newsweek International for, uh, from a, uh, <clears throat> a, the largest aviation insurance company in the world. As we go through here now, we're gonna go toward my studio. Uh, so this is a private area. Here on the left is my very first monument. It must've been crazy because this is a, uh, I was uh, an illustrator in Atlanta and the church came to me and said, uh, you know, we're doing this church. They didn't have any idea of the difference between a painter and a sculptor. So they said they had a, they had a monk who was gonna carve this for them out of wood. I said, well, you have a problem. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, termites eat wood. I said, you need to do it out of bronze. Well, I have never done one. This is uh, nine feet, 3000 pounds. And I also did a 26 foot uh, by eight foot by six foot deep uh, stained glass window. And he floats in midair coming out of that window. These are letters from famous writers. I love these guys, Dean Coons and Tom Harp, former Tom Wolf. And uh, I was knighted, uh, uh, that's uh, I think by Burger King. <laughs> so in here, we have a couple of awards. There's National Sculpture Society a long time ago. And uh, honorary, honor, you'll see honorary doctorates and letters from, uh, prestigious people. This is uh, Prince Charles. I, I did uh, a, a whole series. I had two studios in London uh, where I studied for the Royal Ballet and did a lot of work. So Prince Charles, 
invited me to Buckingham Palace, which is really special uh, to even get into Buckingham Palace, but to have been invited personally by him was, a, was an honor. He and I would speak about art. He's, a, he's an art uh, lover and he also paints watercolors. This is a dinner at Buckingham Palace where 120 people are seat, seated at one, at one table and uh, uh, very honored there. We'd have cocktails before and all, this, all the things go with it. Um, these are the honorary doctorate, and of course, the fellowship fellow for the National Social Society, honored by the Olympics Committee. This is a piece called Dawn. So now we're going to go into a place where nobody's allowed, except at certain times of the day, so that I can perform. And so uh, this is one of my main studios. I have another one in Las Vegas. And so now we'll enter the, enter the studio. And as you come in, this is another plain air painting off of my deck in Hawaii. And paintings and drawings, watercolor. And as you know, being a sculptor takes a lot of effort, a lot of you know strength. So you come in here. This is my uh, this is my workout facility, uh, techno gym, weights and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and we have. Uh, coffee and whatever else that, what, that I need. This is a, actually an antique I bought uh, of Clodion, very famous sculptor from way back. Oh, and here's Shimburu. This is a, a, a photograph uh, out in the valley here. And I, I, was, I ran him at it 60 miles an hour. Here's a wonderful, I, a, Pavarotti and I, Luciano Pavarotti and I got to know each other. He invited me to his birthday party. I was doing a monument of him, but then he died. And that's uh, Bon Compliano. Uh, it was fabulous. So um, this, this um, oh, we have one over here. This is interesting. This little piece uh, I call first position of an attitude. You can see the attitude he's got. There was a fire in Virginia and the only thing left was the fireplace chimney and this sculpture. Everything else was destroyed. The, the finger melted off. Uh, the marble base broke. But uh, I, I really need to put that in a glass box. I, I like that. It tells you it tells you how what we do lasts. You know, I like the idea. As an illustrator, I put my heart and soul into it. Then you flip the page; it's gone. So doing sculpture, we here at the studio, it's good for a thousand years. It doesn't go out the back door. So we're really proud of that. Um, this is a study from uh, one of my master's workshops uh, that was in, um, I think Gary Price was in that, uh, in that. This is, yeah, that's one of the shots with the cheetah. He's alive. <laughs> they got him off camera. They have uh, chicken necks uh, to keep his attention. <laughs> couldn't do that with the Black Panther. The Black Panther was a psychotic. He couldn't, couldn't trust him. So now in here, uh, and in the other studios, I work on about 20, sometimes 40 pieces at a time. That way, no piece is uh, developed for, uh, uh, for economics. You know, I have a lot of people, we have a lot of overhead and everything, but I can't make art for money. We do have a, uh, I hate the name, but a line that's called a Tevier. And that's for those people out there when I uh, developed a partnership with Cirque du Soleil. Uh, I had a couple of galleries in Las Vegas, and uh, we had 830,000 people going through one of the galleries, and so we didn't want to disappoint them, so Cirque asked me to come up with, a, with an idea, and so I tell you, we sell them every day. Um, in here, you'll see, uh, I do a lot of busts. These are not commissions. This is just me. Well, the one in the middle is Willie Brown, the mayor of San Francisco, and that is at City Hall, uh, but um, all of these are just... Uh, playtime, fun, creation. These are some of my friends from Cirque. Uh, this is one of my models. I walked in, my, my employees were uh, sketching her and I saw her there and she, obviously she was pregnant and she was at the very end. If you look at her face, you can tell she's not really happy about it. And, and her body has changed uh, a lot. This is a resin actually. Famous surgeon, Dr. Burke Brandt, that is amazing. And this uh, photograph is just not all of them, but a lot of the pieces that I studied in London and here 
to study, to, to create a monument for the Royal Ballet. Here's a plaza I designed uh, down here and so forth and so on. <clears throat> this is actually one of my models in action. So you can see how difficult that is to create. And so we move from one to two to three pieces uh, so he can take a break because you know, he, could, he could die. Uh, original drawings, this is a very old one. Um, and um, so as we come along, I wanted to share with you kind of how I work and how the studio works, because as I said, we're only interested in the absolute best quality. No matter what economy or what disasters come along, we are still standing. And I think because we are dedicated and we're inspired to do uh, really the best work we can. And so uh, in the studio, uh, as I said, we'll start with a very small work uh, like this. This is with Tim. This is actually done at one of my workshops. Quick study at first, and then, and then took a little more time to detail it out. And a couple of my bottles, leap, and then that will appear. <laughs> and the other one is, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? So now, as you look around, uh, we'll, I'll share with you kind of some of the things we do. This is a, this is a two hour study, two, two and a half hour study. Um, I had a friend come in from New Zealand. So we, uh, I flew in a couple of models and, and uh, just did a quick study here. I haven't done much with it since. Um, this is a piece called Genesis. This is the DNA molecule. And then the, then the couple, as you see, the basis of who we are um, and how we begin. And I, I have plans for doing this in, in uh, uh, four columns and the different races, uh, life size. So that's the first one. Now in here, there's a lot of stuff going on. You see all kinds of sculptures in the background. Uh, and right here, we, this is a piece called uh, Blind Courage. And you can see the arms are cut off. This has gone through the mold, so it's destroyed. But I'm using the head uh, right now because uh, we're enlarging this. And as you know, a lot of us use uh, uh, the foam now that's computerized and then you get this thing, but it never works for me. Uh, it, it, all it gives me is a core. Uh, as you can see here, it is right here. I, I'm starting basically from scratch and the foam becomes just the core uh, of, of, of uh, the actual piece. And then I'll add the clay and develop the character, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are new works underway. I'm, I'm, uh, I love Rumi, the poet. And so I've got a piece, it's about um, the depth of your self and this is water, this would be a waterfall. I haven't figured it out yet, I'm still working on it. The pandemic's really uh, affected me as well as you a lot because I couldn't use live models. So I would um, work on other things. I restructured my whole company and redid this whole building and so forth and so on. And uh, now we're getting back to business. I just worked on a model last Sunday. So over here, what we do is uh, take us, uh, this is a piece that's already been done. The photograph is a draft. So that's why you see the texture, but a piece called yin and yang. And as I said, we, we take a photograph, our uh, Epson printer, and we enlarge them up on a photograph to take a look at what size I want to do. Uh, how, how do I want to invest my time? Because basically from the small one to the large one is about six years unless it's dedicated uh, like the US Open or the Olympics where it's you know, 18 months or something like that. Uh, in this studio, as I said, this is a teaching facility. So Paige Bradley was here for what, nine years, uh, started very young and went through the whole process. And uh, uh, we encouraged her with the galleries and the business and taught her a lot of, a lot of different stuff. I understand she's very, being, being very successful, it's great. And then also I, moved uh, Stephen White from London and his family. Uh, he came here to uh, Monterey and he worked in the studio working on the one Earth United States Open along with 11 other assistants at that time. Uh, and the workshops uh, were headed up by Ed Ike, I love Ed. I think he's in Georgia now teaching. And then uh, Garland Weeks came to one of the workshops and I said Gary Price, a bunch of other people. So I'm very happy with the idea that this is a teaching facility as well as a creative uh, studio uh, that can, uh, you know, can do many different things. 
I have great gratitude for that. It's very inspiring. These are, we have a, we have a process here that many of you probably uh, don't use or don't know about. Um, <clears throat> to create the quality and have it lasting uh, before the digital, digital age, um, we did what's called a hard copy, which is made out of resin, and we do a bulk copy, which is made out of plastic. As you know, molds do not last, and they are sometimes disintegrate over time unless you uh, hermetically uh, uh, seal them uh, with wax and then plaster inside, which is a lot of work and doesn't necessarily work all the time. Uh, so each one of the pieces that's created in this studio, every single piece I've ever created, and I'll show you in the next room, is hermetically sealed and, um, and boxed and sealed and RFID coded. And we keep a complete inventory with a scanner gun so we can tell everything we have and where it is. Same thing with an inventory. Uh, the studio is completely tech um, and uh, so that we can integrate because we have people in various cities, we have galleries. Uh, we lost a lot of galleries during the pandemic. Uh, fortunately for us, we have our own family owned galleries and I have collectors worldwide. So they continue even during the pandemic. Uh, one guy bought 54 pieces of nine heroics last June. Uh, so, uh, so you see where you enlarge that. Then here's another piece called Venus, but I reflected them. And now this is gonna be a waterfall <clears throat> and that's about the height, about eight feet. Uh, and this is a study to see what we can go from, from there. Uh, there's a lot of <clears throat> works that are in concept that I'm not gonna show you because it's too premature, but we have a lot of them that are multi figured pieces. Um, and uh, this I like, I, I just am redoing this shape. Uh, this is one of the older pieces though. Uh, portrait of Sergei Polin uh, and um, reflections that I'm working on. So these are resins uh, that, that have been pulled from the molds and uh, so that I can uh, work on them. You can see plasters, things going. This is from one of my master's workshops. Both of these pieces were done at one workshop. Uh, that's about a two hour quick study uh, of Maurice Harvey. He was a, was a famous painter. He's deceased now. This I thought would be interesting because when I did the Grand Coda, which is, I think it's 16 or 18 feet, I can't remember. And uh, it's, uh, there's one in Asia. This is the uh, engineered design for the internal structure out of stainless steel that goes inside the piece so that it can last and withstand hurricanes and um, tornadoes, et cetera. In fact, the flare, uh, they said it couldn't be done. So I uh, had an alloy built at $4,000 a foot just for the metal, went 16 feet in the ground, went up inside the piece and around, and it worked. Atlanta, the plaza was hit by a tornado, 800 miles an hour, wiped out the buildings around it, you know, the glass and all that stuff, and, and uh, he survived, so it's, it's good. Um, let's see, is there anything else in here? Um, we can talk questions and answers when we get to that point. But again, you can scan the studio. Those are the bust and the, oh, that's one of my studio assistants that didn't pay attention, the guy with the mask. Um, that actually is a real skeleton from India. We don't need the mask anymore, we should take it off. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the studio. So from here is the creation or in Las Vegas in the other studio. Uh, and the studios in London are no longer, we, we, I don't use those anymore. Uh, but in, in Las Vegas, they're used every month. So those pieces are then molded by my personnel and then brought into the foundry. So coming up next is uh, the mold room. And in the mold room, introduce yourself. Hello, Matt Lewis. Matt, Matt's been with me a long time. He is an absolute incredible mold maker and an incredible artist himself. And so he's working on repairing the mold, I think, right now? Yeah, repairing the plaster so we can finish the mold up. Right. And then uh, here's, a, here's an example of one of our molds. It probably looks a lot like yours. Uh, you know, some people want to know what kind of clay we use and all that sort of thing. Uh, um, uh, you, you probably remember the, what was that movie? Uh, Jurassic Park. 
the, uh, the Tyrannosaurus Rex in Jurassic, Jurassic Park. After the movie, they took all the clay down into 55 gallon drums. I bought it all <laughs> and added it to my own, my own supply. And again, you can see the, uh, the uh, TV screen here that shows all of the projects going along and he can flip through there and decide and figure out what's happening here. We have a repair, we're trying to get this piece. This is a kind of a bottle of leaf, but I, I'd like to see it up at an angle. Um, and oh, this, uh, this is what we get, as I told you earlier, from the computer. And for me, this is just the beginning. <laughs> so this will all be carved down and then Matt will cut it open and put it like he did here. And you put in an armature and build all this, build all this armature here and then we'll carve all this down um, and get it out of the way then i'll load clay and sculpt it uh, matt's been here through quite a few of these remember lnj matt yeah. comes in lnj i've done twice or three times yeah cut it finished it he's going to start molding it and i came in and chopped the whole and chopped it all up and start all over again <laughs> until we get it right right that's right so um anyway thanks matt sure so here you have uh this is, this is just a marquette for the gathering of races, a waterfall that uh, we have in Asia, we have um, California, we have one in Texas. In fact, the one in Texas is right around the corner. This is resin, but of course the bronze. And then I hired uh, Disney Imagineering to help me engineer the water uh, because you have to have these tanks and you have to have baffles and so forth to make sure the water comes out exactly right. Uh, you can go on my website or we can uh, get you the actual waterfall. Uh, this is the height of it though. I don't know what that is, about 14, 15 feet. Okay, so in here, this is one of our warehouses. These are works that are going out to clients, getting ready. And then the boxes you see, these are all, all marked, studied, has a quality QC, and then has an RFID tag. And this is just some of them. There's many more than this. They're in various places in the building. Um, and then a lot of our other inventory bases, those are, those are bases. Uh, another maquette, this is a maquette for the, but we'll actually see this one in another room. So now we're gonna move through into another part of the studio. Uh, here we have offices for inventory, uh, sculpture fulfillment and uh, production. Uh, behind you right there, this is a photograph that shows you how I work. This is an actual shot of an actual day working in London. This is a very famous guy by the name of Sergei Kalunin. I think he got 17 million hits in one uh, 24 hour, 48 hour time. And there I am sculpting this piece while he's flying through the air. One of my models from Sir. And now from the studio and then the mold room, now we're gonna go over to the wax room. And to get to the wax room, we have the, uh, we have the monument room. And this is, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a, what we call a uh, uh, hard copy. It's made out of resin. And uh, that's not the full thing. That's just a portion of it. And you can see behind in the background, that is the monument for the 100th United States Open in its entirety, about 15 feet. And with the base and everything, about 30 to some thousand pounds. Here's the maquette. This is a study. It's called Momentum. Uh, the president of Pebble Beach asked me to do this and I turned it down about six times. Uh, he was a friend of mine. So I said, well, you know, I'm gonna hit him with a number that's gonna make him either blink or pass out. Unfor uh, fortunately and unfortunately, he took the number in less than five minutes. So um, there's a little study for the uh, gymnast. We have a half life over here so we can move over there. Uh, this is a little break room for everybody. Uh, and so they, got, they have billiards and, uh, and coffee and you know, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, then we have uh, some of the uh, stuff from the player. I actually had a, I actually had a wine. Uh, we had uh, all the t-shirts and the hats and all the stuff. But I didn't take any money from that because I thought that was too commercial. So I gave all the money for each of the events, 10 cities. Uh, the daytime events to the USG, the, the uh, Gymnast uh, Federation uh, internationally, and they gave me 1,500 volunteers. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in each city, 
we'd put on a whole daytime show and then we'd have a black tie at night uh, to raise money to pay for the thing and to move it across America. Here's a half light here. And here's the piece installed. <clears throat> the thing that I also like to do is I don't just do the sculpture. I design the plaza, the water, the lighting and complete turnkey installation. I love the architecture and I like working with it. Uh, when we, uh, and so that, that's one of the finest. So now we're gonna move into the Muhammad Ali. Uh, this is a wax room. Marnia, uh, the only thing really different about this wax room is that they have uh, original fine art on the walls, which I like to create an environment. Uh, and uh, this is Moss working here on some of the waxes. Thank you, Moss. He's also a finisher. Uh, over here, we have to schedule every bronze going through. And so we have a workshop traveler as it works through with each and every piece. Each and every piece has to be quality control to each part. Because I found with foundries, one of the most difficult things is to get the best quality uh, every time. They're busy and, you know, I don't cross hatch, but they do. <laughs> so I didn't care for that. Over here is a wax tanks uh, at various temperatures. Uh, as you all know, this is standard procedure. Uh, so now if we go over here, uh, when they're in the wax room, these are these are the hard copies. You see they have the steel and they're all they're all put together. And these points, we have what's called a Bible. And the Bible on every single piece tells you how far that foot is to the ground, how far that is to the ground, how far that is to there, and so forth and so on. So it's all triangulated to ensure that each time we make the piece, look at this. So you see how this is all put together because the other thing about a foundry and people doing foundry work is even if they're good, uh, I create the artwork, they don't know what I did. No, they don't know exactly what I did. So what we have here, I'm gonna go over here. Just, I was trying to remember who did that painting. A famous guy out of Colorado. Uh, this is a piece called yin and yang, and you see we set in this steel so that we can set these up. And these get these get bounced around. They're not plastic. Uh, these are what we call again hard copy. Millions of dollars worth of hard copies, and then the ball copies are separate. So when we go over here. This is on. On is uh, burning and dating. And many other things. He's a great artist himself. He really can handle wax well. So now you can see these are all set up. He's doing one big piece over here. So now once it finishes the wax room and Han finishes the uh, engineering on the uh, on the, um, uh, the spring and gating, I wonder if we can see in the window. Not really. We'll we'll take you inside. So let me let me talk out here to start with because it's uh, noisy in there. Uh, this is a state of the art uh, ceramic shell foundry. So these tanks you're about to see are about four feet in the ground. They have six thousand pounds of sand in each one, and then the poured silica uh, in each tank. It's about fifteen thousand dollars a tank, uh, and of course it's going twenty four seven. We have all backup um, jet generators and so forth in case anything goes on wrong because as you know it'll turn to a rock you can't let it go so um we have a gentleman in there we just did a full run so uh the foundry is now loaded with shells and now this new week we have some leftovers from in here so you, you will see a few of them uh but they've already moved on to the next state so now i'm going to go in so you can at least see it okay and see if we can if you, I'll, I'll try my best to talk louder Come on in. Now, now he's dipping. This is Emilio. So he uses the crane, he uses the crane to move it around. Here's our first dip tank right here. This is a this is a main dip tank. 
goes from, it goes from one tank to another tank to another tank, different materials on out and then to the final. And then once it's done and we close up this room, right now we shut down a lot of the machinery because it's even louder. Uh, so these are some of the pieces. So these are looking all wax here. And then here's uh, a few days of dip. really noisy in there. I hope you can hear us. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go out and uh, around to the foundry. I think we're pretty fortunate that they are poor. This is a day that they pour and maybe we'll get a chance. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, Sylvester Salone is a collector of mine. This is a whole series of illustrations I've done many, many, many years ago. Now we're going to go out the back uh, and over to the foundry. This is the back of our studio. And as you can see, it's a gorgeous uh, setting. Uh, this building is on three acres. We have uh, several trucks that we use and vans and so forth. Uh, all the forklifts and, you know, uh, uh, scissor lifts, et cetera, whatever you need. I also stomp with a wave. It's my favorite. It can, it can do uh, whirls. So we're going to come over here. Uh, right now, right now, they're about to pour. Look at here. Thanks, guys. Soaking mat. So these are the shells. They just came out of the kiln. Come on over here. This is a full computerized kiln uh, that I, I had built because it has zero pollution. Uh, it has triple afterburners so that there's no pollution here. And it burns these uh, holes out completely. Uh, and gets them up to the right temperature. And now they're getting ready, ready, ready to pour. Uh, we are so fortunate to work. See them over here, you can see on the shelf, these are all molds that are ready, all burned out, ready to pour in various uh, pieces. I don't know what here. This is a heroic right here. There's a leg, uh, <laughs> parts. Right, and so here we go. Yeah. Is that better? Here we go. Molten metal. There we go. This is absolute quality control, where we are in charge and responsible for the quality of everything we do. And these guys are the best, absolute best. One thing about pouring bronze is you don't want to piss it into the mold because it won't reach the bottom. Uh, so they're they're really good at it. Thank you guys. I really never wanted a foundry, and for many years I went without it. Uh, and I had a lot of people. As a matter of fact, I had at one time 105, 105 people, uh, and. Uh, you know, particularly when you're doing monuments and when we're doing monuments, etc. cetera. Um, around, take a look at this. This is a piece called Orpheus Ascending. That's the photo. And that's what I'm about to build now. Then in here, we have another, this, is, this one's already built. That's actually a photograph of the uh, two-thirds life 
uh, El Angers. And uh, that's the height, but I actually made it a little bit bigger than that. This is the gathering of graces. You saw a resin, which doesn't come anywhere close to this. This is bronze with stainless steel infrastructure. And you can see the slit is perfectly rear's edge so that this has a beautiful thin veiled uh, uh, waterfall that comes out of both sides. I designed the whole surround cloud for it's in a few houses in Singapore or Asia, Vietnam, Woodside, Texas. Uh, some more of my friends. <laughs> I love this guy. He's great. And now once the metal comes out, of course it comes in pieces. And then uh, we're right behind you, so uh, maybe we should, I don't want to flash them. Oh, you can't flash them, can you? Okay, so now he's building another uh, waterfall now, and you can see the pieces and parts. And then uh, we have a little, a lot of small ones that he's working on as well. And then we have Bryce over here, and he's working on, on the bench. We have several quality control areas and uh, hard copies for them to use to go by. And so they'll they'll check the piece against the hard copy. Uh, and you can see up here, this is the uh, workshop traveler. So every one of them carries a workshop traveler and you see everything is skewed so that we can track it. And we know exactly where it is and who touched it actually. In front of you is a piece we just finished. It just got patina. Uh, had a, got a patina. Uh, and this is called duality. And uh, this is now going to go to the heroic side. It's got a whole meaningful symbolism to it, etc. Okay, so then these are other uh, pieces. This is actually the study for the uh, for the three grades of waterfall. Angelina? This is a study from my master's workshops, actually. I sculpted this guy in a couple hours, and then I taught them how to compose the female. And uh, now we're going to go into, this is a piece called Blind Trust. Uh, this is the female version and, and Blind Faith. And this actually has a rotating device that's not in it yet. Now we're going to come over here. And uh, right turn that. And Jordan started with me, uh, what, 12 years ago? Yeah. About 12 years ago, 12 years ago, knowing nothing and has become just a great patent work. He and I work together on these. I design all of the patinas. Uh, we have a, a mix that we have that's proprietary. Uh, and uh, uh, we come up with new new ideas and new ways to do patinas with uh, some of the uh, pieces that we're doing. Uh, over here, that's called Inspiralto. You can see you got three booths here. You got small one, middle, and huge. <laughs> So, and then if we have to, and we do, we'll go outside to do that. Now, this one was just finished. This is called Sison. And that's part of the Royal Ballet studies that I did. Uh, here's one that's uh, in uh, silver or uh, platinum. So, this is our patina area. Let me say thank you. Now what we do is that uh, here's another television device so they keep up again. And our, then we go into shipping and we, we do do some of our shipping here, but we also send out and sort of, and we do have transport. We just shipped uh, a huge shipment across the, uh, with the ship and um, um, a freighter, of course. And so now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, just to give you a little reference, 
I'm going to go the full circle and then we'll go back to the studio uh, for some Q&A, for some questions and answers, okay? So in here in the hallway, uh, we have uh, illustrations for book covers. This is for Bannon Books uh, uh, or Hartford Row. Uh, it's actually uh, oil painting, metalware actually. After joining her, this is a retirement of Lou Brock, so dark. Uh, this is a painting for the 78 uh, Winter Olympics and other sketches and drawings. And other illustration as we go. This was the first kickoff poster for the little known company called CNN. This is the very first that anybody ever saw the 24 hour news thing. That's Ted Turner right there. And so this is a, a hallway for, you know, the restrooms and so forth. And then over here we have uh, our kitchen facility for all the people. So that they can uh, take a break. And, and now we're going to head back to magazine covers, American Express. And then we have this here so we can show, public, we bring schools through here. And we bring individuals, uh, uh, we teach, we, we try to inspire a lot of the children with uh, schools and so forth. So this is, shows them how the process works. This is my former secretary, <laughs> Brenda, uh, original drawings. And now we're back to the original. So this is where we came in. And now we'll head back down to the hallway and back to the studio where we can do some uh, sit and talk. And, uh, Answer some questions. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome to ask me anything you want. Um, there was one more clip. All right, and we have another clip. You know, when I walked through the first time, we weren't able to show you this studio in action. So we have a real, real short clip. And I think what we should do. So now in here, uh, I set up uh, time lapse photography, and uh, we're going to show you a real quick one. It shows the studio in actual working with all the different models and pieces that are worked on and the people moving in and out uh, and putting one of the monuments together and taking it apart. And if they would go ahead and run that clip, that'd be great. Uh, and that was done for uh, Shanghai. So you'll see uh, Chinese uh, letters for the actual uh, days of the week. spotlighted <laughs> that, that, listen that's a lot of that's you know this is a i'm sorry we weren't able to cover a lot of the different things but i thought that last part of i'm actually read from the from the the boundary that's hot in there <laughs> so I, I i really want to appreciate all the, all the people here at the studio that helped uh, bring that to you in the best form we could uh and um i had i i know we're going to answer different questions but somebody said Great art and Toyota, Toyota like production. You know, well, you know, if you want quality, it's uh, we're organized. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, 
I'm free forming here, but uh, when it comes to production, trying to really do the best of it, uh, it is more like Toyota like production. It's 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 quality, it's precise, but it's also um, because their job in in producing the work is to ensure that if I were to look at it, uh, you know that uh, that it, that it's right, and so they know uh, that um, they're on, but they're also on anyway because they have such a pride within themselves and about what they're doing and what it's what it means and how long it lasts uh, that that uh, it's all good. So uh, I'm ready for some questions and answers if you like. Thank you for that, Richard. I'm going to read the questions because we have so many viewers, which is a testament to how wonderful your work is. Um, uh, we have a lot of comments as well that we'll share with you later. But right. um, one question, um, who do you aspire to be like, or who inspire us, inspires you, or what do you, uh, is there another artist or someone that you aspire yes. to you take inspiration uh, from? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, I love art history. I studied a lot of it. Uh, Dr. Cangliosi from uh, USC was a great inspiration. Uh, I used to go to Bryant Brand Library when I went to college, and uh, uh, I was one of the only people that would let, let me carry out a whole stack of art history books. And so, you know, you take art history from the beginning, so you've got a basic fundamental foundation which I think is really missing in most of our schools and universities. That's one of the reasons I opened master's workshops. Uh, uh, not that I knew what I was doing, but at least I was getting somewhere and I could help someone. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, but art, art history is number one, uh, taking a look. But uh, certainly I, I keep up with what's going on in the world, but I, I really uh, am not so interested in letting it influence me. I, I'd like to, uh, from my own being uh, speak whatever it is that I see or feel or whatever. And, uh, and that's all I've done. Um, I don't like, uh, you know, I have a lot of people copy me and I, I, I don't understand it because I just can't do that. I can't, it has to be original. Uh, it has to be from the soul and it has to be inspiring and connecting with human beings. So, um, but any, anyone who, and, and it's not just sculpture, it could be architecture or drawing or, or, you know, whatever. I find business so creative. And you can see that in a, in a world like this, this is, a, this is a, a major business. When you have 105 people and you had, at that time we had like 70 galleries worldwide, it's a, it's a tremendous business. And the marketing, uh, moving a sculpture across with a 10 city, uh, tour that had black ties in each city and we marched it down Michigan Avenue and up Fifth Avenue in New York. I mean, it's, that's a big deal. So we consider ourselves top professionals. So wherever I see that, um, whether it's uh, Tony Robbins or it's a uh, John Portman architect or, or uh, that's an older one. I was think, trying to think of the one that's really good. The famous guy now, uh, um, guy's about 90 years old. He does these great, those great, abstract buildings, you know. Richard Gary. There you go. <laughs> Richard, I mean, come on. So, uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, I'm inspired by life. And I, I think that the challenge is within myself. I'm self-taught. I'm a classically trained painter. I know nothing about sculpture. And so um, uh, working hard at it, uh, you know, like a lot of you or a lot of people that are successful. I mean, I, I put in tens and tens and tens of thousands of hours. I don't know if you noticed in that film, but that was Saturday at three in the morning. <laughs> so uh, whatever, whatever it takes, right? Um, yeah, so I'm inspired by that. I, um, there, there are a, a, certainly a few artists that I know nationally, George Carlson or someone like that who can paint and draw and sculpt. I really admire that. I, I, like, I like the folks who can do diversity, you know, whether it's, uh, creating the whole architecture and the plaza, the concepts that bring things to life for people. Um, the Vietnam Memorial, the abstract one, um, uh, her name escapes me, I think it was Lee. Uh, uh, she's a great concept. 
really, really moving. So it doesn't have to be figurative, but uh, I've chosen figurative because uh, I think most of us know it's dying in the world. I mean, you don't have a real center for it. You have the National Sculpture Society, but I'm talking about uh, universities and schools that really sponsor this sort of thing. Very few, very few in poverty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what would your advice be to sculptors who want to emulate your success? Well, we're looking for apprentices all the time. We had uh, as many as 11 apprentices here. I've moved families and apprentices from Poland, Italy. Uh, I told you Stephen White, I moved he and his family uh, from England. Uh, we, everybody here is from somewhere. Angelina is from China. Matt is from Georgia. Uh, Adris is from Afghanistan. He came here to work for me. Uh, so we have an incredibly diverse team. And so um, I, I would say to those folks that uh, want to know how you get there, you, gotta, you just have to work hard, be dedicated, be inspired. And uh, if you can find uh, a workshop with a really good artist, that'll cut through it. Because, you know, my workshops, I mean, we, or just this tour, uh, you learn things and you can cut through it. I mean, as I said, Paige Bradley was here for nine years. Um, I designed her first booth in New York. Uh, so learn all kinds of, of, uh, of things working in a major studio. That's a great place to start if you can. Uh, and it, and it cuts the education down a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lynn is asking, uh, she's saying aloha from Hawaii. Do you seal or how do you seal or finish your outdoor pieces to maintain the color? Well, a lot of the things we do, of course, are proprietary, but we use standard materials. Uh, <clears throat> I'd have to ask Matt. Matt is the genius with materials outdoors. But uh, it's, uh, it's a, um, Matt, what, what is that? A catalyzed urethane. Thank Stop you. Over. There you go. Yeah. Um, how long do you work with a dancer before you both achieve the pose you want to sculpt? Okay, let's start with the word pose. I never pose. Okay. These dancers are flying around the room. We're, we got the music blasting and, you know, I don't know if you looked at that film, but I had three or four or five models. We had to cut it because uh, <clears throat> uh, on, on some of the films, we can't use the nudes. So there was a whole series. We cut out half of that uh, time video that we did because there was a lot of nudes in it. Um, but uh, really nobody poses. What, we, what I do is I work uh, like I showed you the guy uh, on that uh, photograph behind me that was standing on a pin um, uh, or even the Royal Ballet. I'm, I'm, there's no photography and I'm just watching and I'm feeling what I feel. And then I use that emotion to target something. And uh, that's the song, the heroic that was in the patina booth. She was flying over the top of my head. And then I got up in my scissor lift and watched her from up above. Uh, when the tango dancers are in here, they're teaching me tango and I'm laying on the floor watching them going through. So it's, it's, a, it's a performance process, uh, but, but, it, but I wanna go back to that person who wants to know what to do. Uh, really understand anatomy thoroughly. I have a great friend he came to one of my master's workshops. His name is Andrew Kars, and he's great. He was with uh, ILM, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, and he was a big time director or whatever on, on some of the films. And so he wanted to make a switch and learn more. After the workshop, I said to him, <laughs> I said, uh, Matt, would you go give me that piece? I said to him, you know, you're really talented, but your anatomy sucks. <laughs> So listen, now I want to tell you what it takes. This guy comes back to me in one year, in one year, and he gives me this as a gift. This is probably the best anatomical piece I have ever seen and used by artists, for artists, okay? I mean, it's got, uh, I'm having a hard time, getting, there we go. It's got everything you could imagine <laughs> and, and just an absolutely fully articulated, beautifully done uh, anatomy figure. He was inspired because I said, 
you know, you got a problem. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, you overcome it. When I became a sculptor, I took, uh, I took Gray's Anatomy, the book. I cut it up every single page and I pasted it all over my studio and studied it. When I did the cheetah, I took the entire anatomy and studied it and the physiology uh, and the culture, uh, uh, the society of the cheetah. And then I ended up donating a lot of money to the Cheetah Foundation because they're dying out because they're too close to each other genetically. So one of the things I love about, uh, I'm completely free. I mean, I started doing commissions and uh, then I had that fire and it moved me into, into the fine art galleries. But the main thing I, I love is the absolute freedom uh, to do anything. But you have to have the foundations uh, if, if you're going to do this type of work, uh, in order to really um, be good at it. And so uh, in my workshops, uh, we study. I mean, I do, I'll sit here and do uh, out of my head a 45 minute study. Then I'll have a model and then I'll do another 45, two hour study. And I do that and I do that. And a lot of people that I taught, I would say, do three of those, pick one and throw the other two away, fashion. Them. Put that one up and do it again. Do it again and again. Take your best, put it away, do it again. And um, perfect practice. It's not practice, what was it uh, Lombardi that said, it's not practice that makes perfect. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. So uh, a discipline and uh, working through that. And I wanna share this with you too. You can be the greatest artist in America. But if you don't understand business, you don't understand value, and you don't understand distribution and all that kind of stuff, it, you can't get the funding, okay? We spend millions and millions and millions of dollars a year just being. So we have to not only love the creation, but we have a team here that is outstanding. I mean, they're outstanding financially, technically, all those kinds of things. And we're we got hit by the pandemic. I mean, we're no different than a lot of people. A lot of the galleries that represented me in different countries and different places, they went out of business. And uh, we reorganized and uh, I, I brought back my absolute best people and we've loved it. We've, we've, we've really done well and we'll continue to do so. So you have to understand that uh, when I used to teach, I, I used to do ads in your magazine, the Sculpture Magazine, where I said, um, this master's workshop was about the art of art and the business of art. And I don't like the mix too. When I'm in this room and I'm creating, I don't think about business. I don't want to talk about it either. We've got other rooms and other ways that we go for to do that. This is a sanctuary that's about creation and thinking. And what you're not hearing is the music that's going on in here. <laughs> I blast the guys out in the back, you know, various kinds of, all kinds of music. Uh, so um, really study, uh, if you're gonna do figurative art and do it at, the, uh, at a top level, then you have to really know the tools. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a painter, so I studied classical painting and composition. So, you know, a lot of the compositional moves that were done in the Renaissance, I use them. I use them differently, I don't use them. Uh, so I don't know if I answered that one question about where do you start or how can you. Yeah, I think so. That? We have some more questions as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Angela de la Vega is asking, um, when, when you start, um, are you thinking about when you're doing an out a, a large piece that's being installed outdoors and you design the, the entire thing? Are you thinking about the design of the stone base as part of your original concept? Ah, okay. Oh. okay. So let's let's start. Two. We have two different lines that we're talking about. <clears throat> we have a sculpture that's happening uh, as a state of mind in this studio that has no particular reference, and we don't know where it's going. Um, a lot of those heroic pieces that you saw, there was no total deliberation on what exactly they were going to look like and where exactly, somebody asked me where they're going to go. I don't know. <laughs> they're going to go in somebody's house or in a plaza or whatever. I'm just going to do it. My, my goal is I just create 
the best art I can create and somebody will buy it and it'll go somewhere in the world and be appreciated. On the other hand, if I'm doing the Olympics or I did the monument in Alaska or Texas, I won the sesquicentennial for, for Texas. I designed the thing, the reason I won that contest because you had some great artists that came down to three of us, Glenn a good acre and Ludkey and myself. I designed the whole plaza. We did a sunken plaza, waterfall and lighting and everything else. Um, now, when I'm doing a monument, yes, I'm considering that. I'm considering the angle. As a matter of fact, when I installed that Olympic piece, we were putting it in the ground, welding it up for 24 hours, about to put the granite base on it. I changed my mind. I walked around and around and around, and I realized that when you walk down these quadrants to it, it had a kinetic, uh, it was kinetic. If you did it a certain way, when you actually walked in on it, it would turn. Not really, but psychologically and visually, it would turn. So <laughs> I had the guys take it up, and I thought they were really going to be pissed off. So there were about, I don't know, 20, 30 guys working on it. And so when I asked them to move it, they stood up and applauded. <laughs> I thought that was so, so incredibly good. Uh, so um, uh, the design for a plaza or a, a specific, a site specific, totally different, totally different. And as a matter of fact, I, I mentioned also, I don't do them often. I don't want to do them often. Uh, I like just creating my own artwork and then enlarging and whatever, because I don't have, I don't have a committee. I don't have a budget. I don't have somebody, you know, uh, attempting to say this or this. I'm not doing that. So, um, but if I am doing a project like the Olympics, the U.S. Open, or uh, uh, Royal Ballet or something like that, then I have specific intentions. Does that make sense? To me, it does. Yeah. Uh, Christina is asking, how can we take a workshop with you? Do you teach workshops? Well, well, that's interesting because um, I quit doing, I, I was doing workshops for about 15 years. Ed Ith was running the workshops and that's before I built the foundry. I had uh, four studios for the various apprentices here and I had the workshops and, you know, really enjoyed it. <clears throat> but then uh, I, I was uh, forced to do a foundry because, you know, I, I just needed the better quality. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm considering doing the workshops again. And the way they're done, uh, and we're, we're getting organized in that right now, and that is we have to review the portfolios. And we're going to be doing an online thing, too, to help so that, that, that I can mentor people by having an online thing where we can maybe do critiques or we can do uh, help uh, that they can have, you know, be helped. Or on the workshops, those are, those are, those are good. Uh, th this uh, this piece right here is one of the workshops that was in the Scottsdale workshop, and so uh, this particular piece this is this is was kind of interesting because we had had this guy from Sudan uh, modeling, and uh, on Wednesday they had been working towards a goal. And on Wednesday I said, for those of you who want to stick around, I'm going to do this piece out of my head without the model here to show you what you, you need to do in terms of taking a look at it and memorizing the piece and so forth and so on. Now, this has been taken beyond that because the model came here, but for, for about four hours, I created this, this piece and then spent another probably, uh, no, probably 20, 30 hours on it afterwards. Let me put this back. So uh, what, we, what we can do is uh, when, you know, when we get it all full ports, we'll actually probably uh, put an ad in your magazine. Like or we, we'd be happy to share that information if you'd like us to with Excellent. everybody. And so when we, when we pull that together, it's, uh, it'll be limited like before. It'll be portfolio review. Uh, and before, they came from all over the world. Uh, they came from New Zealand and China and Italy and New York and all over. So it was kind of cool because then you got this whole cultural mix that was kind of wonderful too. Yeah, that's great. So I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of more questions and then I'm afraid we'll have to end or we'll completely wear you out. I'm fine. Okay. I'm, good. I'm so, just cooling off. I'm just cooling off after that boundary. I can see why you have that gym. It's a workout. 
um, what drew you to sculpting dancers and how does this theme drive your practice? Oh, I love dance. Um, the, the thing I like is, uh, you know, I'm attracted to the concept that when the music starts or the drum beats, people move. It's just this natural human. I love the human psychology and the human culture of things. And then when I was 15, 16, and 17, I used to dance uh, competitively on television as my, as my creative escape. Uh, and so uh, I'd choreograph and then do some stuff. And then I left it. I certainly don't do it anymore. I'd embarrass myself. But uh, uh, dance is um, the movement of dance and the, and the uh, sign language, if you will, the, of dance is, is really interesting uh, in choreography. I'm, I'm not gonna do much of it anymore. Uh, I've, I think I've done so at least 75 or 80 sculptures of dance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like, uh, if you look at both studios, I'm, I'm working on all kinds of different things. Like I like the one I showed you with um, Genesis that used to, the original was called Origins about just the pure nature of, of uh, of uh, male and female companionship, love, whatever. Uh, and in our environment in the world today, we could use some, <laughs> some softness, if you will. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on all kinds of concepts that are different and uh, dance isn't one of them right now. I've done a lot of it, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Christine is asking, um, what is your favorite type of clay to use when you're modeling it? Clay, I know you work at uh, Alpedia. Yeah. Um, well, we make our own. Uh, oh. We have a, a Roma Plastilina base. But like I said, I bought, uh, I bought the Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, a couple of tons of it. Uh, and then we, we have a machine and we... we uh, what do you call it? We, we reconstitute it. We add, we add oil and different things. Wow. I only use, I only use plastilina because I used to read about Rodin and all the problems he had with water-based clay. It was horrible. And so I had a water-based clay piece over here, a nice little piece with a, with a, a mother who was nursing her baby. And I went on a trip, I think to Asia or some island or something. I came back and was in shards. So I just, I work on too many pieces for water-based clay. So I use oil-based plastilina, basically. And I don't like that. I know that uh, a lot of guys use that Chavant, but it's, it's not, uh, so far I haven't gotten used to it. Uh, I just, I guess I, I like what I, I use. That's, yeah, it sounds like you, you invented what's right for you. Yeah. Um, Linda Lindsay is asking, um, when you're developing fabrics that are flying, um, what do you use to stiffen your form as you're developing the fabric? Oh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of different things. Uh, super glue, uh, wire, uh, whatever I can get my hands on and whatever's going to work at the time. You know, there's no, I don't have a, uh, sometimes I use cloth. Uh, sometimes I use all kinds of stuff. Uh, but uh, when I'm pulling it and dragging it, I, sometimes I use super glue uh, just to keep it where I want for a period of time. But I want to tell you something. By the time I get done, most of it's all cut out. <laughs> and there's wire. It's just wire. But I, I start with, uh, you know, take a look at it. Uh, and um, I have one up here. It's, uh, I can see the blindfold from one of my uh, pieces. I can see the kind of cloth. But it's just a, you know, it's, it's kind of like a preliminary. And then once I've got it, I don't really care about it. In fact, it, mostly what it does is get in my way. So I have to use a scalpel to cut it out and, you know, it, it gets in my way. <laughs> so Rena is asking, and I think you've partially answered this, and, um, but how, how did you get started? And did anyone mentor you? How old were you when you started getting big commissions? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, when was that, Christ? 1983. How did you get started? Yeah. Okay. I I was a very a pretty successful illustrator rep in New York. And uh, so I, I was moving. And I that's what that was my life. Uh, you know, uh, plain air painting and painting and drawing 
do every day. And, um, and like I said, I was doing a commission for a painting and I did that horse study. Uh, and, and then uh, I read an article, I, I don't know if it was in Sculpture Magazine or some other magazine, CA or some magazine. And now a friend, Bruce Wolf, was in there and I was looking at him and he had done these bronzes. I went, you know what, I'll try a couple of bronzes. And uh, so I did uh, four. And that's when the church came to me and, uh, and then I did this, uh, this uh, church. I wish I had a video of it because it's, it's uh, pretty magical the way it just floats, almost floats in the air. But um, uh, I was an illustrator, the church came to me, I got the commission, I lost money. I, I didn't make any money, but I loved it. And um, it was very challenging because I'd never done a stained glass window either. That was 26 feet by eight feet wide. And I, had a, I, I met a guy who knew about stained glass windows to begin, so Jim Gangler. So he helped me uh, figure a lot of it out, but we built the whole thing in my studio in Santa Barbara. Bay. And uh, then uh, 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 my ex-wife entered me in a contest. I had no idea about it. And that was for the Texas Sesquicentennial. And then I won each monument I entered into until I had a fire um, that um, uh, that burned me out, destroyed everything. And no, I didn't get any help and no, there was no mentors. Um, I wish there were. Uh, I asked some guy in Atlanta who was a professional sculptor, uh, you know, cause I was a pro and he was a pro. And so I said, hey, you know, can you feed me a few ideas or talk to me about it? And he said, well, come and clean my studio and work for me and maybe I'll talk to you. I said, no, I don't think so. So I've, I've, hey, I dug a hole in the ground. I went to a night class to learn wax. I did the wax, right? And I, uh, I learned how to cast by sorta. And so I dug a hole in the ground, took this bus that was about like this big around because it was Ludo, you know, strapped with chicken wire and you know, the old, old fashioned way uh, and rammed it up and then uh, melted the metal and poured it in. And I'm excited, you know? And so I take a Jeep and a Hauser rope and pull that sucker out of the ground. And I'm chiseling on that to get the Ludo off. And you know, when you first see it, it's like magic. It's like gold, you know, you chip it off and there's the bronze and it's gold, right? Well, I kept chipping off, there's no eye. <laughs> I chip it off, there's no nose and no mouth. So. I'm really naive. So I take it to a welder who welds a ball and a ball and a ball. And then I'm really smart. So now I'm gonna take a chisel instead of all the tools we could have. And I'm gonna chisel this thing out of bronze <laughs> and then sand it, whatever. And I just got fortunate because the Prince of Saudi Arabia bought it for a lot of money. Uh, and um, uh, so I, uh, I did, I did a couple of them. I did uh, four, I think, and then I did that monument for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the church. But I got to tell you how bad it was. So patina, right? I'm a painter, so I know about color and all that kind of stuff. I'm classically trained for that. So patina, I take hydrochloric acid and I stand back in and dump a bunch of nails in it, <laughs> and then I take pennies and do the same thing. So now I got ferric and I've got cupric. <laughs> Learn by I'm, doing. I'm probably fortunate I'm still living. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's what, what I'm getting at is uh, you got to do it. Uh, and if you can find somebody to fund you, great. I don't know how, how you get that. If you can find somebody to teach you or mentor you, like here in the studio, this is a professional working studio. We're looking for an apprentice, aren't we? Yeah, we're looking for an apprentice. And uh, uh, this is the best place uh, because you can learn not only how to create but the whole process and so forth and so on. And you pick up on the business because you're working with the galleries and that kind of thing too. Yeah. That's, that's really the best. My, my way of doing it by digging the hole in the ground, that, that happened a few times. So I'm not, I'm not so sure that that's the best way. I think uh, the fire really put a fire on me. 
when I'm looking at my dead dog in the yard and I'm looking at the smoldering smoke and I just bought that house, so I have no money. And now I got to figure out how, what am I going to do? So I looked at the paper. I could find, find a job as a grocery clerk. I said, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. So I came up with a business plan. And the first one was so simple. If I could get six galleries to sell six cultures a year, I could make a living. And I said, well, I need 10. But then the problem was uh, they had to buy them. And as you all know out there, who are listening to this, who are sculptors, galleries don't buy sculpture. And so I had to figure out a way to do it. And I did figure it out. And every one of those 70 galleries bought the artwork. That's and that crazy. started things started things rolling. But uh, wow. so all of us have to do it in our own way. Thank you. And that sort of expands on, there was an earlier question about the atelier process, if you could expand on that. But I think you just did about learning in the studio and learning, yeah. No, um, I, I think that that is, uh, that is the oldest, best means of education that I think there is. Yeah. Or find somebody who's good. You know, you're gonna pay $250,000 for a college education. Uh, it used to be when you were an apprentice here in the early 90s, I didn't pay you. Uh, now we, we, we pay pretty good actually. Um, but um, uh, it's, you know, it's like going to college. Um, and um, I mean, look at some of those people like uh, Stephen White or Paige Bradley or Gary Price. I, I can't even remember all of them uh, who've been to the workshops or who have worked here, but um, uh, it's, really, it's really a good way to find it. Yeah. Christine Knapp is asking, how many hours do you work in a day typically? Well, since the pandemic, it's different. Uh, but my guys will tell you that uh, depending on what I'm working on, <clears throat> uh, when I was doing the Royal Ballet or some of those big projects, um, uh, easily 10, 14, 15, 16 hours. But you know, um, it's not like work. And I, I have a trainer, so you gotta, you know, you gotta stay in sh shape. And when I did the monument, uh, I have an ice bucket to put my arm in the ice to get it going. And then for some of those big ones, I use a two by six bat to put the clay on. <laughs> um, but a lot, a lot of hours. Uh, I don't, don't pay attention to that, but um, one of my favorite things to do are these uh, quick studies. Uh, they're, they're about uh, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours. And when I do those workshops, the master's workshops here, I, on Wednesdays, usually I would do a full figure in about two hours, two, yeah, two hours, two and a half hours. So you just, it's a rhythm, you know? And what that does is that really, it's like playing the piano over and over and over and over and over. And it's fun. So, but a lot of hours, a lot of days. You know, my family would probably tell you that they don't know who I am. The good thing some of them work with you. Oh yeah, a lot of them do. I did. Yeah. My son and his wife run the galleries in Southern California, Palm Desert. My daughter here, and uh, my nephew was in Las Vegas, but he's uh, uh, working with a major gallery in Los Angeles now. Oh, and my nephew is our designer. He also graduated from Art Center, and so uh, he's a, he's a good designer. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Doug is asking or commenting first that you've done some beautiful terracotta casts. Um, oh, thank I, you. Of which he owns one. And he's asking if you are producing any more work in terracotta. Uh, not really. Um, no, not really. Not, we, we've, we've moved to uh, terracotta resin. It's a, like a look um, because I like the look, but um, we were actually casting terracottas. No, I'm not. It's a whole different, I've got, I have, like I, we said at the beginning, I don't know if you caught it, my daughter had said 650 or something like that. And my, um, my uh, um, operations uh, manager here said 900 and some pieces. So um, I like to carve marble, but it takes a long time. I've carved uh, maybe five or six of them, seven feet tall and stuff like that. I like it. Um, you know, you get that <laughs> 12 inch, 4,000 RPM grinder and stuff. 
popping that marble. It's 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 pretty interesting, but uh, I really like the clay because I'm a, like I said, I'm a painter. So plain air painting, and then you take the you take the, the oil um, clay and you know just move with it. Wow. So, so no we, um, there are, I'm going to share the additional questions with you, Richard. But I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, we've taken a lot of it, and you've, it's, this has just been terrific. But um, I, we are going to wrap up, and I, um, I really just wanted to say that concludes our visit. And for those of you who had who had questions that we weren't able to answer or didn't get to because they're they're sort of endless, uh, please email the offices directly, and we will follow up. Um, and again, an enormous thank you to you, Richard. It's really been special. Thank you. And I'd like thank to you also thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction and to your entire staff and team who were all extraordinary in helping us organize this. We're so grateful to get an inside glimpse of your creative space and um, and also to spend more than half an hour just sitting chatting with you. It's been great. So well, thank you, th Glenn. Appreciate it. And so do we. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone at the next event. And until then, please stay safe and be well. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>